So picture this, war in Iran, gasoline rationing at $5 a gallon, a military draft, a Chinese takeover of Taiwan, double-digit inflation and unemployment, and the draining of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. As John Broder reported in the New York Times, this is where current energy policy is leading us, according to a nightmare scenario played out as a policy-making exercise in Washington, D.C. by a group of former top government officials. Called oil shockwave, the role-playing game colorized the perils of American dependence on oil imported from unstable and often hostile regions of the world. The purpose of the exercise? To trigger Congress to take action on energy, energy policy and legislation and to influence the presidential campaign. The mock group of presidential advisors worked furiously in a make-believe situation room to come up with advice for the president. It was led by the National Security Advisor, played by Robert E. Rubin, Wall Street Master of the Universe and former Clinton Secretary of the Treasury. As the list of really bad choices multiplied with cascading crises, Rubin lamented, this wouldn't be this big a problem if the political system a few years ago had dealt with these issues. The mock Secretary of Energy, former EPA head Carol Browner, added, year in and year out, it's been difficult to get a serious national energy policy. Astoundingly, the U.S. has no national energy policy, much less a plan for a post-oil world. Drill, baby, drill. Since World War II, the U.S. military has become a global oil protection force. We spend about $140 billion a year just to guard oil traffic in unstable regions. The Iraq War not only failed to corner one of the last great reserves, it's radically draining the Treasury. Nor is it any coincidence that the map of terror and the map of oil in the Middle East are almost the same. The vertiginous cost of oil transfers massive amounts of wealth to the Middle East, while our escalating debt indentures us to China, Japan, and Europe. The dollar's value falls inversely with the rising price of oil. Oil dependency exposes the U.S. to perilous vulnerabilities in global power politics. And as peak oil looms, China and India compete for supplies from Latin America to Africa and Asia. Russia fiercely protects its pipelines to Europe and cuts deals with Venezuela. Potential global flashpoints metastasize, not to mention global warming. Meanwhile, Germany seizes the solar high ground. Denmark rides the wind future. Japan leads on conservation technologies, and China institutionalizes higher fuel efficiency standards with the stroke of a pen and leaves Detroit in the dust. Hello, national energy policy, anyone? David Orr is widely regarded as the country's leading environmental educator, but a couple of years ago, he stepped through the academic looking glass to put education into action to directly solve real world problems. Among the projects he took on was to help organize PCAP, the Presidential Climate Action Plan. Drawing together a network of experts and strategic thinkers, PCAP is putting into play a practical 100-day climate action plan for the incoming 2009 presidential administration. It's based not on political expediency, but on the best science of what nature needs. It portrays a win-win scenario. Doing the right thing on energy will also build prosperity, jobs, and justice. It will pluck the sweetest strings of American ingenuity and values. David is arguably the world's most important innovator in environmental education. He's been instrumental in advancing the concept of eco-literacy and engaging countless educational institutions in its pursuit. His influence extends well beyond education into, into uh, ecological design and biomimicry. David's a professor and chair of the Environmental Studies Program at Oberlin College, the cutting edge model of a genuinely holistic interdisciplinary approach. He was the central force in the creation, design, and building of Oberlin's fabled Adam Joseph Lewis, Lewis Center, a $7.2 million environmentally intelligent environmental studies center. What a concept. <coughs> David's been a board member of the Center for Eco-Literacy since its founding a decade ago. He contributed the foreword and, and two chapters to the Bioneers book guest edited by the Center called Eco Ecological Literacy, Educating Our Children for a Sustainable Future. 
and we're very honored J David also joined the Bioneers board this year. So please join me in welcoming David Orr, the man with a plan. It's really nice to be here, and I want to say, uh, start out and say a word about Kenny and Nina. This is terrific. This is a gathering of the tribe. And we're here again. This is what, the 19th year, isn't this terrific? And the change makers are here, and this is our hour, and we're going to move the world rapidly now. Uh, I'm between Dune Lankard, and what a great talk. And I've done the Copper River with Dune, and I believe all the, the oneness with nature that he talks about. But beware that if you play Dune in basketball, <laughs> all the oneness goes away. <laughs> and he's got a deadly left-hand jump shot. And don't play him on his court because it slopes down. Uh, anyway. <clears throat> Uh, it's really nice to be here. I'm going to uh, uh, talk, as my friend Wes Jackson says, on this side of the Big Bang. If you're interested in the other side, that's an afternoon session. That's a joke. Uh, I'm going to talk about climate change and the, uh, the evolution of the climate uh, action uh, program we started. Here's what I'm going to do. Five seconds on the human condition. It doesn't deserve any more than that. Uh, the last eight years of the human condition, that'll be quick too. Emerging leadership for the human condition, that's another five seconds. Principles of strategic thinking, quick. Uh, and then the serious stuff, 15 minutes or so. So let me start with the, the human condition. Um, your questions. <laughs> now, the, the, uh, the last eight years of the human condition, <laughs> why are you laughing? Emerging leadership for the human condition. Uh, <clears throat> and then principles of uh, strategic thinking. You may have missed this, uh, but... <laughs> there are some things it's easier to get into than out of. And it's, you don't want to stir up the hornets if you don't have a good exit plan. <laughs> now, you, you may have missed this. Um, you can get this on discount from Amazon. It's a, uh, and you can get the box set now. at a fairly, uh, fairly steep markdown. <laughs> now, the serious stuff. Let me, uh, let's move on here. Uh, <laughs> something has been gaining on us. If you get real quiet, you can hear, hear it happening. This is what it looks like a little bit. This is a uh, graphic taken from the uh, uh, Stern Review on climate change. Across the top are degrees of warming, one to five and then a series of variables that include food, water, ecosystem, health, and so forth. The slide misleads in a couple of ways. One is that a lot of the things that uh, start over there at yellow and go to orange and go to red, which is severe, uh, actually have begun already, or a little bit to the left of where you're seeing it. And then it misleads in another way. If you had things really accurately portrayed, you'd see a lot of cross arrows. Obviously, what happens with water affects food and ecosystems and so forth. But that would be a slide that would be uh, too hard to read, and you can't read that one anyway. This is where we are. 
We've warmed the planet about eight tenths of degrees centigrade. Already been done. Been there, done that. This is where we're headed. According to IPCC and the latest scientific evidence, there's no question we'll warm the planet another half degree to perhaps one full degree. And given the lag in the way uh, the ecosystems work and the biosphere works, uh, this means that what we're now seeing in terms of climate uh, anomalies is a result of what came out of our tailpipes and smokestacks 30 years ago. Increasingly, science tells us that two degree centigrade is the threshold beyond which we don't want to go. That's perhaps the limit of safety if there is any such limit of safety. That's where we don't want to go and you'll notice that there's not much of a gap between those numbers. So if you look at the big numbers, we have, according to Jim Hansen, maybe 10 years, but he said that three years ago. And it wasn't 10 years to figure it out. It wasn't 10 years to get the right kind of policies in place. It was 10 years to start the deflection of CO2 in the atmosphere downward. We're now at about 387 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. Hansen and others are increasingly converging on 350 as the, the upper limit of safety, but we're at 387, and if we can get back to 350, we've got to trend back to about 300. You get the point. Two degrees centigrade, 350 parts per million, uh, maybe now seven years, and let's assume maybe that's wrong by four or five years, but we've got our work cut out for ourselves. This means in big numbers, we've got to go in the United States from about 22 tons of CO2 per person per year back down to about two. How do we do it? Well, two and a half years ago, uh, several of us, including Ray Anderson, who is here, and uh, Bill Becker, and about 200 other people got involved in developing a climate action plan for the next U.S. administration, focused strictly on the first 100 days of the administration. And the theory here is very simple. Time's not our friend. We've got to move as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, so we put together the plan. You can go to the website at the bottom of the page here and you can download the entire document. The final version of it will be available in several weeks. Uh, next week, an electronic short version done by uh, Bill Becker, who's been the terrific executive director of this effort, uh, comes out. It's the first e-book uh, done by St. Martin's Press. And you can download the, the book. You can get it on Amazon or go directly to St. Martin's. Now, what's wrong? Here are some, some of the starting point for us. First of all, we spent about $45 trillion to subsidize oil, gas, and coal since 1960. $45 trillion. We spent uh, $74 billion to $1 trillion a year, depending on if you include state and local uh, uh, activity or inactivity, as the case may be. 66% uh, to fossil fuels, 12.4 to nuclear, 7.6 to ethanol, 7.5 to renewables, 2% to conservation. In other words, about 10% of our energy expenditures and research and development has gone to the right things, about 90%, mostly to wrong things. The uh, second assumption that we, we've operated with is that this isn't a matter of Republican and Democrat. It's not liberal. It's not conservative. It's simply common sense. This is a national emergency. And you can be a good conservative. You can be a good liberal. But the point is the same thing. You have to be honest about the way the biosphere works. And we have to move this country very rapidly in a different direction. Another assumption is that climate and energy policy isn't just another thing on a long list facing the next administration. This is the linchpin that connects everything else on this list. Get this right, and we'll get lots of other things right. Get it wrong, and everything else will be worse. It's the largest security issue the United States has ever faced. We had a briefing for the transition teams of both candidates. Uh, one of the members of the transition team uh, got up, a, it was an admiral in the US Navy, and said, if you thought the Cold War was a security issue, you've seen nothing yet. Climate change is the largest security issue facing the United States and facing the entire world. That's the opinion of more and more people in the security establishment and also the CIA and so forth. This is not an issue that should divide corporations from the public sector. It's all hands on deck time. We've all got to join in this effort. Another assumption is that this is a, an opportunity to build a very different kind of economy. Van Jones Green Jobs Program. <laughs> Thank you. 
It's an economy built around first efficiency, secondly renewables, but think of everything else that we have to do, all the way from funding to incentives to hardware development, insulation and maintenance. There's another economy that's ready to be born. It's long overdue. Uh, that's Jack Nicholson. You remember the movie? A few good men. Tom Cruise has Jack Nicholson on the stand. There's been a murder on the base, and uh, Tom Cruise turns to Nicholson and says, I just want the truth from you. It's a very tense moment in the, uh, uh, very tense scene in this movie, and Nicholson's comment, you remember that, was, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> That's the best imitation of Nicholson I can do. <laughs> Now, there, there's a viewpoint there that we aren't up to it. Uh, T.S. Eliot once said that humankind can't bear much reality. On the other hand, there's Winston Churchill. And when bombs are falling on London in 1940, Churchill didn't go to the British people and say, hey, this is a great opportunity for urban renewal. <laughs> he didn't say we can whoop up on the Nazis at a profit. He said, I don't have a thing to offer you but blood and toil and tears and sweat. And he called them to heroism and they responded. This is the, a big picture of what we, uh, what we face as you come through the, the, uh, the slices here, business as usual is in the background. What we as part of the PCAP are calling for is no less than an 80% reduction of CO2 by 2050. Heavily front-loaded, so a lot of those gains and reductions happen within the first uh, 10 or 20 years. The other slices here are all the other legislation that uh, <clears throat> has been on the books. How do we get there? Well, we've got to do it fast, which means that R&D will help, but that's not going to be the place where we want to put most of our effort. It's got to be easy. It's got to be cheap. It's got to be resilient. Uh, the metric here is really quite simple. It's the amount of carbon taken out per dollar spent. And then finally, solutions have to not just switch problems, but actually solve problems. Uh, any questions on that slide? Uh, <laughs> don't you just love PowerPoint? You can put things on the screen. Nobody can read it. This is an eye exam. You know? This actually is a rather important uh, uh, graphic. This is from McKinsey and Company, the, the business consultants. The, the line across the center is basically the break-even point. The vertical axis is the, the dollars per uh, uh, carbon re uh, eliminated. The area to the left of the break-even point roughly equals the area above it. Long story short is what the graphic shows very conservatively is we can take out about 30% of our present carbon and energy use at no net cost. That's 30%. When McKinsey released this, well, let's see if a few of you are interested in efficiency. When McKinsey released this, they said that this was an understatement. You could go to 40 or 50% change a few of the assumptions, but if we had the right kind of leadership, which we're calling for in PCAP, this could easily go to 50 or maybe even 60%. This is a uh, tale of two uh, curves or two trends. The uh, blue line here is California energy use. This is not working here. The blue line across the middle is California energy use, which is basically flatlined out here in this pit of misery and destitution. <laughs> Uh, the green line is, is U.S. energy use per uh, capita, and that's, that's gone up. So you have to explain why California is basically flatlined on energy consumption and use while the country has gone up. In terms of economic growth, thanks. The red hatched line is uh, uh, California economic growth. The yellow hatched line is U.S. economic growth. So how is it that California grew faster and grew better and, than the United States at large and yet didn't increase energy consumption? It's called efficiency. Uh, <laughs> it's fast, it's cheap, it's easy. This is a Prius and of course hybrid sales are way up and we can do better yet. There are cars on the drawing board at 100, 150, 200 miles per gallon, plug-in hybrids with solar collectors. This is a PV array uh, at the Lewis Center. Uh, the cost of photovoltaics is dropping dramatically as all of you know. Uh, the market is expanding very dramatically, at least it was before the bank failures. This is the, uh, the Adam Joseph Lewis Center, which I believe is still the only entirely solar-powered building on a U.S. college campus. Uh, wind power. Uh, incredible, the Apollo project, uh, which is represented here, has put the numbers together, a relatively modest investment, uh, basically a, an Iraq-scale investment. 
adds an incredible amount of jobs and economic growth. We can do these things. And the wind market again is up 40% plus. Now, here's what they want to sell us. Clean coal, that's right, that's right. Uh, if you believe in clean coal, uh, now, the life cycle of coal, there is nothing clean in this. I'm not going to read that. You can read for yourself. But from start to finish, this thing is dirty. And then here is the, the uh, we hear a lot about sequestration of carbon. Uh, you can put super critical carbon underground and hold it. We don't know whether it's feasible. We don't know the way you can do it and hold it there. And if you can't keep it there, what's the point of doing it in the first place? No one knows what it's going to cost. Uh, it will not compete effectively or at all with efficiency and renewables. And then there's the, uh, this little problem of energy in to take to sequester carbon and, as compared to the energy you get out of it. Now, <clears throat> God put coal underground for a reason. <laughs> and she meant for us to leave it there. Marianne Hitt is here, and Marianne's been one of the leaders to try to stop mountaintop removal. 1.5 million acres of Appalachia has already been leveled, 480 mountains or whatever it is now. You can go to the appvoices.org website and see that. Here's what Appalachia should be looking like. You take the top off the mountains, you lose one full category every 500 feet uh, that you move, move it down. Here's the other thing you want to sell us, nuclear power. And this is one of those things like, uh, you know, Friday the 13th, how do you get the wooden stake through the heart? Uh, this, this plant is a uh, one close to us, and this came within two weeks of a core meltdown. We found that in court documents that came out uh, a few months ago. But within maybe two weeks, uh, the problem was discovered entirely by accident. But nuclear power, uh, how do I list the problems? It is subsidized. We pay for the insurance of a major uh, loss of coolant accident. If you can make a reactor, you can, you're real close to being able to make a bomb. The cost is prohibitive uh, for 1,000 megawatts. It's 6 or $7 billion, but who knows? The net energy is really debatable if you go from the whole nuclear fuel cycle from mining all the way to uh, waste storage decommissioning, and so forth. And then there's the civil liberties implication. If you have a solar collector, uh, you're not likely to be on the FBI uh, surveillance list. But if you've spoken out against uh, nuclear power, chances are you will be on a uh, surveillance list. How many FBI agents do we have here, by the way? Is there, um, <laughs> nuclear power is slow. It is economically uncompetitive. It is dangerous. It is undemocratic. It is a very expensive way to boil water. <laughs> now, are we ready for change? <laughs> New York Times poll a year ago, look at the numbers here. The public with the right kind of leadership and the right kind of information is ready for change. Uh, two slides from a BBC poll taken about a year ago. And this is interesting because it's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, they asked people in 21 countries, will it be necessary to increase the cost of fossil fuels and will you support that in order to avert climate change? Even in the United States, 65% said yes. Is it necessary to change your lifestyle to avoid climatic change? 79% in the United States said yes. We're ready for change. Now, a couple of final thoughts here. The energy debacle of 30 years, of the past 30 years, perhaps a bit longer, and climate, not change, climate destabilization is the largest political failure ever. It isn't just an economic failure. What do we do about it? Well, number one, I talked to Ricky Ott and uh, Tom Lindsay's been on this stage saying the same thing. Let's say three strikes and you're out. Recharter corporations. We pay anyway. Why don't we have federally financed elections? How about restoring the fair and balanced standard to the FCC guidelines? 
That means to hold a license to the federal airwaves, either radio, which is now 91% of talk radio is right wing, or television, you've got to present uh, fair and balanced coverage of all issues. Number four, how about ending the revolving door between government and business? If you're a public servant, we'll pay you well enough, you won't have to go and prostitute yourself uh, serving as a shill for industry and working on K Street. How about a tax on advertising? <laughs> Roughly in proportion to the carbon implications of the product being sold. You know, for a bankrupt country, $700 billion bailout, but our military spending, including the spending for wars, Chalmers Johnson estimates not at $625 billion, but over $1 trillion. Cut it in half. How about this? How about confiscating all profits on making weapons? No one, no one can profit by making weapons. You don't make weapons. You make weapons in sorrow, not in the anticipation of making a killing. Pardon the pun. How about civic education? We need to become citizens again. We need to understand the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and how our government works. But we need everybody in this country to understand the basics of U.S. government and the principles of democracy. How about ecological literacy? Nobody, nobody graduates from a school or college or university without understanding how the earth works as a physical system and why that's important to their prospects. As a corollary, if you don't know how the world works as a physical system, we'll take your degree away from you. <laughs> Imagine Yale taking, well, never mind. Uh, now, how about the rights of posterity? Uh, talk about abortion. Talk about the abortion issue. Or whatever your views of abortion may or may not be, the climate change issue is about abortion of intergenerational, whole generations across time. This is the abortion issue writ large. We've got common ground. Constitution mentions the word posterity only in the preamble. There's no case law. But there are now, now a number of people beginning to work on uh, developing the case for the rights of posterity where our behavior, the, the behavior of a single generation, can impair the, uh, the right to life and liberty and property. Elaine and I have a stake in, in posterity. These are our four grandchildren. Aren't they cute? <laughs> they have no voice, and their grandchildren have no voice, unless it's ours. They have no rights unless we grant it to them. That's part of our challenge. Let me conclude with this. One of my favorite uh, people on the planet is Thomas Berry, the, the philosopher and theologian. And Tom, in a, a wonderful book called The Great Work, defines uh, the great work of any generation is not something it would choose to do. It's something that it accepts as a matter of duty and obligation and right. And our great work is actually pretty straightforward. Number one stabilize and then reduce greenhouse gases. And we don't have unlimited time. We've got to move on this as rapidly as possible. Turn that coin over. And the next major thing is we've got to make a transition to renewables and efficiency, a very different kind of economy. We've got to build a post-carbon economy. Can we do that? We know how to do that. Most all of you in this room are engaged in making that economy work and making it fair and decent and just. Fourth. We're going to have to re-engage the international community. We can't be Fortress America. We can't be isolated. We can't save ourselves on this. This is a global issue. And when we strike that bargain, it's going to be, it's going to be a tough bargain. We've got to go from that 22 tons of carbon per person per year back down to two. Fourth item. How about changing the way we think about our role in nature? How about adopting Janine Benyus as our patron saint? How about... <laughs> Actually, you can't do that until she dies. I don't, Janine, I don't, mean, I don't mean anything by that. But how about changing our worldview to one of precaution, humility, fairness, and decency? And then finally, how about changing our politics? 
Politics of trusteeship. No more swift voting. No more character assassination. No more stolen elections. No more dirty tricks. No more lies and evasions. How about politics as the exercise of deliberation, of foresight, of wisdom, and of care? Let me, let me close with this. Uh, please, in the, the spirit of good citizenship, remember, remind all of your regressive friends to get out and vote on November 5th. You get out on November 4th. Let's change the United States of America. Let's get back in the lead again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.